British Army's interest in aviation began with balloons. After 15 years of experimentation, a trials unit was formed by the Royal Engineers in 1878. Captain James Templer was appointed as their first ballooning instructor. In the early 1900s, as the unit was enlarged, Lieutenant Colonel John Capper of the Royal Engineers took command. A balloon factory was created at Farnborough and Capper became its superintendent. This factory was the precursor of the famous Royal Aircraft Establishment. Before he handed over command to Kappa, Templer had begun development of the next stage of military aviation, the airship. But by the end of the decade, powered aircraft were starting to take their place. From 1911, the Army's mixed collection of aircraft was under the control of the newly formed Air Battalion. However, Within a year, enormous growth led to the founding of the Royal Flying Corps. Three years of exercises and manoeuvres between 1912 and 1914 barely prepared the Royal Flying Corps for war. Uh, during the First War, there was an enormous increase in the use of aircraft and the building of aircraft by all the combatants. And uh, in Britain, um, it was necessary, therefore, to, uh, to build uh, uh, as, as many types as we could. It was quite easy to learn to fly once you were airborne in about 10 minutes and the controls were in your hand, provided you had sufficient height for safety, you could perform the necessary functions of turning, climbing and descending. The great thing was to be able to maneuver that aircraft, to first of all get it off the ground, and secondly, after you had completed your flight, to get it down again. So most of the time was spent by uh, aviators learning to fly in performing those maneuvers. The First World War saw massive aircraft development. The early spotter planes had to be armed and rifles soon gave way to machine guns. Air superiority moved between Britain and Germany as new purpose-built fighters were introduced. It was not until the appearance of the Bristol fighter the SC-5A and the Sopworth Camel that Britain finally achieved mastery of the air. During the war, 35,000 pilots were trained by the Royal Flying Corps. Over 8,000 were killed, many of them aged 19 or 20, with less than 30 hours flying experience. A pilot learned quickly if he wanted to survive. When the RAF was formed, the Royal Flying Corps had fought in many theatres of war and had won no less than 13 VCs. At the beginning of 1940, there was an introduction of airborne forces by the German army. This was shock troops, very fast, very quick. And it was apparent that this was a, a new way forward in warfare. And so Winston Churchill ordered that airborne forces in the United Kingdom would be formed. The Army Air Corps comprised of a number of units, the Glider Pilot Regiment, for example, the Parachute Regiment, and for some time, the Special Air Service. On September 1st, 1957, the present Army Air Corps was formed. This was from units of the Glider Pilot Regiment and the AOP squadrons. Army aviation had grown over the years, but certain units had become obsolete. For example, gliders were no longer used. The last glider operation was the Rhine crossing in 1945. And a few of those glider pilots then transferred and flew Osters in conjunction with the AOP squadrons as liaison units. The AOP still carried out their duties as uh, observation, looking for the guns and plotting the enemy. But it was thought that both these organisations must be joined together because they both worked for separate organisations. And so, because of this, they form the 2nd Army Air Corps as a cohesive unit. Osters and their pilots had earned the lasting respect of commanders and soldiers of both sides, but the new demands of modern warfare had relegated the Osters to a training role at Middle Wallop. Middle 
Little Wallop started as a flying school. However, the threat of German bombs in English skies transformed it to a key sector station in 10th Group Fighter Command during the summer of 1940. When the threat had passed, Little Wallop became home to a succession of aircraft from the night fighting bow fighters of 604 Squadron to Mustangs of the United States Army Air Force. During the Cold War, Middle Wallop's grass runways could have disappeared, but the creation of the Army Air Corps gave it a new lease of life. Middle Wallop is, is the home of the Army Air Corps, and this is where all our training is done. Not only the pilots, uh, but also our ground crew, and our REMI technicians are all trained here as well. There's probably 2,500 military people here at any one time, but also a large um, civilian membership too, some three or 400. I have a large civilian contract here which runs all the aircraft maintenance and a large portion of the um, flying instructors are civilian. There's some 70 aircraft here, uh, chipmunks, gazelles, lynx, and then the historic aircraft, um, Sioux, Skeeter, Oster, and Beaver. The Beaver had proved to be a real old soldier for the army in Germany, Aden, Borneo, and Northern Ireland. But after nearly 30 years of service, it was replaced by the Britain Norman Islander. Used as a utility aircraft, its main role is that of low-level photographic reconnaissance. It is now the only fixed-wing frontline aircraft used by the Army Air Corps, as, since the mid-50s, the helicopter has taken an ever more important role. The Joint Experimental Helicopter Unit was formed at Old Sarum because it was the introduction of the helicopter onto the battlefield. Very similar to 1914, the aeroplane was new, the helicopter was a new machine. And the Royal Air Force and the Army carried out trials for a number of years, how you could use the helicopter in its new environment, should you put a gun on it, can it carry troops. These things we take for granted nowadays, but in those days it was very new. The Army Air Corps helicopters in the very early years were obviously small aircraft and could carry very few men and they certainly did not carry any machine guns or any anti-tank missiles in that day because it was perceived that those aircraft would return to the role of reconnaissance aircraft as they were used in 1914 by the old string bag aircraft. It was only later on when the Americans in Korea and later in Vietnam used the helicopter as an assault weapon that the British started to arm their helicopters. But at the present time, of course, the British Army does not have a purpose-built attack helicopter and so weapons have been added on according to the role the aircraft is doing at that time. For example, the Scout was used as an anti-tank busting role in the Falklands. It took out Argentinian bunkers. Machine guns were put in the door in places like the Radfan and Aden and in this year of course in Northern Ireland where the Army helicopter still plays a very important role. Well obviously the Army Air Corps have been given much larger helicopters since the 4,000 pound weight has been imposed. They now fly the Lynx Mark 7 and it's used as an anti-tank helicopter and the Gazelle which is used as a reconnaissance liaison aircraft. And so the responsibilities of the Army Air Corps as a fighting arm on the battlefield has grown considerably. Well, the Army Air Corps is in existence to support the Army. It's one of the three uh, direct fire arms that the Army's got uh, with the infantry and the Royal Armoured Corps as the other two. But within that rather overarching um, uh, role, there are, there are five specific roles that we carry out. Firstly, we um, conduct armed action, which is mostly with the links with the anti-tank uh, missiles at the moment, but also covers the use of um, uh, machine guns mounted on the links in support of the Royal Essex and Tavern in Northern Ireland, amongst other places. The second role would be observation and reconnaissance. Principally, we use the gazelle for that. Thirdly, direction of fire, both artillery fire, mortar fire, and the uh, control of aircraft in forward air controlling. Assistance with command and control, the sophisticated radio fit in our helicopters allows um, commanders to be moved about and kept in communication uh, with great ease. And then lastly, um, limited movement of men and material. We're not support helicopters, but the Lynx does provide uh, a very flexible um, helicopter which can move groups of men around the battlefield to conduct their business. My experiences in the Gulf um, I had 
virtually in three days. I had a crash on a Lynx, which uh, doesn't speak very highly for me, but uh, virtually two days after that I was back up to flying and I was uh, in, in the only uh, Army Air Corps engagement against Iraqi tanks. Um, the crash was a result of flying at night time in bad weather. Um, these things happen. I was on a mission which had to be completed and paid the price, but luckily both myself and my uh, co-pilot walked away from it. Two days later I'd gone in the road party into Iraq and uh, I was put back into an aircraft and joined the Army Air Corps' only uh, anti-tank engagement with TOW so far, destroying a T-55 myself and the other two links that were with me uh, managed to engage uh, MTLBs and T-55s. I think it was a total of seven we destroyed between us. So we uh, started at a low and ended up on a high really. Any aircraft marking two miles southwest of Alpha 051, you're dropping flares on friendly. This is Chieftain. I say again, any station, any aircraft dropping flares two miles southwest of Alpha 051, this is Chieftain. You're dropping flares on friendly. On the radar. 30, Charlie, 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 uh, have you got the grid of the, um, uh, the entry point through that? Okay, it's good frame. It's good frame. Check, camera rolling, camera is rolling. Three flags, solid selection. And fine now. Fire flag. This door's running. Oh, Roger, right, off it goes, down the way. Roger. Two flags. Okay. Yankees and Tango, Mike and Juliet. Another one. In constraints. Roger, let's get another missile. Solid selection, sure, three lines, fire point. I'm working on right. next out. Firing now. Engage, fire flag. Missile's running. Watch sure, away it goes, what a beauty. Oh, you're darling, good shot. Oh. In constraints. Oh, which one have a nice shot yet? Fine. So, they're on fire flag. Running, what a beaut. Did you say artillery was coming down over your location, sir? The recent round of uh, cuts in the, in the defence budget as a result of options for change almost exclusively left the Army Air Corps untouched. Now this is an indication that the Army and indeed the government as a whole really views the use of helicopters on the modern, modern battlefield as a very exciting uh, and logical extension of uh, a combat arm. The Army Air Corps is due to receive a new helicopter into service towards the end of the century. Uh, it's going to be an attack helicopter and this has been approved by um, all levels in the Ministry of Defence that uh, what uh, the Army needs is an attack helicopter and then the Army and the Army Air Corps will operate it for the Army. This helicopter will replace the Lynx in the anti-tank and armed role and the Lynx will replace the Gazelle in the reconnaissance role. Now there are several contenders for this um, competition principally um, from overseas so the first one is the McDonnell Douglas Apache, which um, came to such prominence in the Gulf War. There's the Bell Whiskey Model Cobra, which is a twin-engined aircraft. Um, there's the South African Rovark. There's the Eurocopter Tiger. There's an Italian um, variant of the A129 Mongoose. And then lastly, there's a Boeing Sikorsky um, aircraft, which is um, a little bit behind the others in terms of the likely data it comes into production, the Comanche. Now, all of these manufacturers are, as we speak, 
uh, making preparations, uh, submissions to the Ministry of Defence as to what they would propose. For us. It's a complete package for the helicopter, training of the ground crew, air crew and the technicians and indeed how we're going to look after it in the field. And these submissions will be um, scrutinised by the Ministry of Defence to see how closely they meet uh, the statement of requirement which we wrote uh, some years ago now as to what we needed an attack helicopter to do. This is radically going to change um, the way we are treated uh, by the rest of the Army and the Army Air Corps. We are going to have a flexible and lethal new weapon system which is going to be able to deploy in all the spectrum of conflict. That's to say from low level conflict in internal security operations through increasing levels of tension to all at war. This particular weapon system has an application at every single level. We in the Army Air Corps are offering young people an opportunity to fly this aircraft. It's an exciting prospect and the Army Air Corps is in the business of keeping the Army in the forefront of technology.